We are pleased to participate in this debate tonight. I would like to begin by saying that our view of God's comprehensive sovereignty is driven by the scriptures. We are not attempting to establish a speculative philosophical system tonight, but to present what the scriptures actually teach. We believe our philosophical worldview must submit to and be ordered by the scriptures. I want to add as an introductory word that we do not believe, I think Brian already said this, but we do not believe the Arminian view is heretical. We believe a view can be incorrect and even unhelpful and still fall within the pale of Christian orthodoxy. So please understand we are not impugning the motives, the character, or the Christian status of Jerry Walls and Joe Dongell. Let me begin my biblical presentation by saying that we believe that the scriptures teach that all things come from God's hand, both good and evil, and yet God is not morally responsible for the evil which occurs, nor is the significance of human agency for the actions performed diminished. So now I want to look at the scriptures quickly. Do the scriptures teach God's comprehensive sovereignty? Yes, Ephesians 1.11. In him, that is Christ, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. All things means all things here. We, this is confirmed by Ephesians 1, 9, and 10. God, in all wisdom and insight, made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. The all things that are united in Christ include the things on heaven and, th and the things on earth. So I think that helps us see that the all things in verse 11, God works all things according to the counsel of his will, includes absolutely everything. Psalm 139, verse 16. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them the days that were formed for me, when as yet there were none of them. The days of our individual lives were formed and ordained by God before we were born. Proverbs 16, 33. The lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. The lot, we, we would say today, the dice. The way the dice lands is from the Lord, which is a seemingly random event. Yes, an insignificant event. And yet, where the dice lands, where the lot falls, is ultimately due to God. It's from the Lord. Proverbs 21.1, the king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it, that is the Lord, wherever he will. The will of kings is ultimately turned by the sovereignty of God. Yes, kings do what they want to do. And yet God is also working out his plan. How that can be so, I will leave to Bruce Ware to explain further. <laughs> God is sovereign over international events. Daniel 4, 34 and 35. At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my reason returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. And he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? In saying the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, he does not mean that God doesn't care for the inhabitants of the earth. He does not mean that God 
doesn't care for human beings. He means that no human being can thwart the will of God. No one on earth or among the host of heaven can stay his will. Ultimately, God's will is accomplished. There are a number of spectrum texts in the Bible. By spectrum texts, I mean texts that speak of the beginning and the end. And therefore, also everything in between, the beginning and the end and all that is in between, such as God is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, and, and He's Lord over all in between as well. Here's one of these texts, Isaiah chapter 45, verse 5. I am the Lord, and there is no other, besides me there is no God. I equip you, though you do not know me, that people may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form light, and I create darkness, light and darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. Shalom, well-being, raw calamity, yes, evil, the hard things that happen. I am the Lord who does all these things, from the shalom, the good thing, the well-being, to the calamity, the evil things that happen. The Lord makes these things and creates them, this text says. Another spectrum text, Deuteronomy 32, verse 39. See now that I, even I, am He, and there is no God beside me. I kill and I make alive. That's the spectrum, isn't it? I give life and I kill. I wound and I heal. And there is none that can deliver out of my hand. How many people would never, if they were writing the scriptures themselves, say about God, I kill, I wound. Well, this is what the text says. I kill, I wound. I submit to you that many, I include myself here, would never, ever have written that. But there it is. Lamentations chapter 3, verses 37 and 38. Who has spoken? and it came to pass, unless the Lord has commanded it. Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that good and bad come? It's the same point. I, I imagine that all of us in here would say, yes, good comes from God, but bad, good and bad, the whole spectrum. Now, I know, again, that raises questions in your minds. And again, Dr. Ware is going to handle those. <laughs> I'm very glad that he's here tonight. The reason we believe in the gospel, here's my next point. The reason we believe in the gospel is not ultimately due to our free choice or our free will, but God's choice of us. Still, we do not deny the responsibility of human beings to choose, to believe, and to repent. Peter on the day of Pentecost does not preach like this. Consider whether you are elect. No, he preaches this way. Repent and believe. That is also how Bruce Ware and I believe you should preach the gospel. Repent and believe. Come to me, all those who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Repent and believe. Choose. Joshua says that in 24, chapter 24, doesn't he? Choose to follow the Lord. But the ultimate reason we believe is due to God's gracious election and choice of us. Yes, we believe, but the reason we believe is God's gracious work in our lives. A few texts. Acts 13, 48. 
When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord, and all who were appointed for eternal life believed. It does not say all those who believed were appointed to eternal life. That's reversing the wording of the text. It says those who were appointed believed. First comes the appointment. Then comes the belief. Yes, they truly believed, but they believed because God had appointed them to believe. A few texts from John's Gospel. John chapter 6, verse 35. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. Notice we're talking about third singulars here. Not groups, individuals. He who comes to me will never go hungry. He who believes in me will never be thirsty. I think you'd agree from the parallelism there, coming and believing are two different terms for the same thing. If you come to me, you won't be hungry. If you believe in me, you won't be thirsty. They're just two different metaphors for the same thing for belief. Coming is another way of speaking of believing. So two verses later, John 6, 37, Jesus says, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. We have seen that coming is another word for believe. So I can paraphrase this verse like this. All that the Father gives me will believe in me. That, that isn't all people, is it? Not all people believe in Jesus. Some do not believe in Jesus. So we conclude that only some are given by the Father to the Son. Not all, because not all come to Jesus. Not all believe in Jesus. Only some are given by the Father to the Son. And those who are given come. They believe. Why do they believe and why do they come? Because they were given. John 6, very similarly. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. No one is able to come. No one has the ability to come. Those who are dead in trespasses and sins cannot come unless they're drawn irresistibly, not against their will, but by persuading the will to the Father. There is another text that figures in this debate, John 12, 32, Jesus says, if I'm lifted up, I will draw all to myself. I, I don't have time to defend this now, but I'm happy to do it in the question and answer. I think the all there doesn't mean all without exception, but all without distinction, both Jews and Gentiles. Finally, Paul, a couple texts from Paul, Romans 8, 28 through 30. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, set his covenantal affection upon, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Those whom he called are justified. Calling there does not mean those whom he invited to believe are justified, because all those who are called, all those who are called are justified. So ju calling doesn't mean invite. It is an effectual call. Not all those who are invited believe and are justified. Only those who believe are justified. And therefore, I conclude that calling is effectual, that calling creates faith. It is like the calling of Lazarus out of the tomb by Jesus. Jesus' calling created life. Lazarus come forth, and the calling gave him life. 1 Corinthians 1, verses 26 through 31. Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise, not many influential, not many noble. God chose the foolish to shame the wise. God chose the weak. God chose the lowly things. Calling is explained in terms of choosing. Why? So that no one may be boast before God. 
In verse 30, it is because of God that we are in Christ Jesus, so that the one who boasts will boast in the Lord. That's why this matters to me and to Bruce Ware. We believe that all the credit, all the glory, all the honor for our choosing of God goes to God. We wouldn't have chosen him. We wouldn't have chosen him apart from his grace. His glory alone is responsible for our belief. Time. So we praise him. Thank you.